Well, it's certainly good to be with you again. I really appreciate you taking some time uh, to join me in the Word of God. Now, before we get into the text out of 1 Samuel tonight, um, I just wanted to quickly pray for our nation. As you know, we, we've had shootings, multiple shootings again, and, and there's... Uh, Great fear in a lot of cities that violence is going to break out uh, in, as this uh, verdict uh, for the George Floyd uh, case comes down. So there's just a lot of turmoil, and we see um, trouble at the border and so forth. There's just a lot of anxiety, I think, in our nation right now. And so we need to turn to the Lord, don't we? But before we get into the Word of God, let's, let's just take our nation to the Lord in prayer. So join me, if you would. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now to lift up our great nation in which we have the privilege of living from day to day. We love our nation, and we're very concerned about where we are as a people right now. As your people, we know that Jesus is what our nation needs. Because we have turned away from Jesus, we have disregarded your word in so many ways in our nation that we are reaping the consequences of those foolish decisions. But you are great and merciful God, and our prayer is that you will awaken the church, that you'll draw us back to a pure devotion to you so that we can lead the way to the restoration of our great nation. Otherwise, perhaps there is no hope. And so, Father, we do pray for your great grace to be showered upon us. And Lord, we would pray for this coming Sunday as uh, we are going to be meeting in our churches again on Sunday morning, and I pray that we'll have more in attendance than we've had. But Lord, we pray for next Sunday evening for this revival, this one-night revival at uh, Macedonia Baptist Church that we're going to be participating in. We pray for a mighty outpouring of your Spirit during that meeting, that you will use that as a special time to turn the hearts of your people back to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk with you for just a few moments out of 1 Samuel 15 about the importance of obeying the Lord. Now, we're going to encounter something as we uh, look at this text that can be troubling and is troubling to some people, many people. God, at some times in uh, Israel's history, uh, asked them, commanded them, really, to wipe out their enemies, to completely destroy them. And we're going to look at a case like that today. And the problem with that, of course, is that it does not seem to be compatible with the love and compassion and the forgiveness of God. At least on the surface, it doesn't seem that way. But uh, I think the right answer to uh, this dilemma is to understand that God knows everything. And God knows when a people, even if there are children involved, He knows when those people have become so irredeemably wicked that repentance becomes impossible for them. And so that is the explanation, you see, for why God would periodically choose to enact His judgment through the hands of His people, the Israelites. Because sometimes they would come across a people that were so far gone, that they would never repent. And the Amalekites in this text are such a people. 
The Amalekites, you may not know this, but they resisted the people of God, the Israelites, as they were coming out of Egyptian bondage. Uh, they went to war with them, and God promised that he would completely um, wipe out the memory. He would just blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven, according to Exodus 17 in verse 14. And then down in verse 16, he said that uh, the Lord would be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. And then over in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 25, verses 17 through 19, uh, we read there that God promises that a day would come when the Lord would have uh, Israel, as we already saw there in Exodus, blot out the memory of Amalek. And guess what? That day in 1 Samuel 15 has now come, and the responsibility of carrying out this mission falls upon the shoulders of the king of Israel, Saul. Uh, I think about 300 years has passed since the Israelites have come out of Egypt. And all this time, the Amalek, uh, the Amalekites, rather, they've never repented. And finally, Saul is commissioned to carry out the prophesied judgment against the Amalekites. And so Samuel gives uh, Saul, in verse 3, clear directions. He says, now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. So in verse 4, Saul summoned the troops and counted them at Telaim. Quite a number, listen to it, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. And then down in verse 7, it says, Then Saul struck down the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is next to Egypt. Well, this looks good. Everything seems to be lining up. Saul appears to have been obedient, but not so fast. Everything changes as we come to verse 8. From verse 8 onward, it becomes clear that Saul has not been truly obedient. It says in verse 8, he captured King Agag of Amalek alive, but he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Well, that was obviously not the command that God gave. They were to kill everybody, including the king. But we'll notice verse 9. It gets a lot worse. Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. You see, one of the great mistakes that anyone can ever make in his or her life is to assume that God is okay with half-hearted obedience. He is not. How do we know? Look at the next two verses. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king. For he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. I guess he probably didn't really know what to do. Because he's got a king that is not compliant with the commands of God. He's not listening to the voice of God. He is not obeying what do you do? Samuel's upset about the fact that Saul is, upset, is, is disobedient. So at best, what he's got here is a heart of half-hearted obedience. Saul I'm talking about. 
How many times do we see the same kind of thing in our time? For example, you have sporadic Bible reading amongst the people of God. They might read the Bible if they are in trouble or if they have a specific question, but they don't read the Bible habitually. They don't know, they're woefully ignorant of the stories and the teachings of Scripture because they don't spend time with God's Word. Oh, they have a lot of information and knowledge about things on the Internet and television shows and hobbies that they have. They always have time for those things, but they don't have time for God in His Word or in prayer. When it comes to giving, well, they've got plenty of money to buy the things that they want in life, but when it comes to giving to the work of the Lord, supporting the advance of the kingdom of God through the church and the world, they don't support it. But yet they call themselves Christians. And when it comes to attending church, they think if they go once a month or once every two or three months that it's okay. That's enough, that God is happy with that. Everything's okay. No problems. Or they permit themselves, because they do go to church, to indulge in various forms of sin throughout the week, thinking, well, because I go to church, that sort of makes everything okay. Like Saul did in verse 13, we might say that we've carried out the Lord's commands. When we really have it, look at what it says. Verse 13, when Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. I think he really believed that he had. Despite the fact that he had left the king and all of those animals alive, which was exactly contrary to what God had explicitly told him to do. So like Saul, we try to make it look as though we've obeyed when we really haven't. I mean, look at what it says. Verse 14, Samuel replied, love this, <laughs> then, then what is this sound of sheep, goats, and cattle I hear? You know, I mean, clearly he's saying, if you obeyed God, how come I'm hearing all these wild animals? And then verse 15, Saul answered, the troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we destroyed. <laughs> he probably just made that up, it's my guess. I mean, you know, he's got to have some excuse to rationalize uh, his disobedience, but did you notice that he can't even bring himself to call the Lord his God? It's Samuel's God. And we clearly saw is far from where he's supposed to be. Now, we can try as we might to convince ourselves and others that we've obeyed the Lord. That's what Saul does. Listen to some of these other verses. We'll start at verse 16. Stop, exclaimed Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, he replied. I think he's, you know, Saul is anticipating some good word from God. That's not what he's going to get. Verse 17, Samuel continued, although you once considered yourself unimportant, haven't you become the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why didn't you rush on the plunder and do, why, why did you rather, why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Now listen to verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agag of Amalek and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. The troops took sheep, goats, and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. You can hear he's just rationalizing all the way through, isn't he? But sooner or later it becomes evident when we haven't truly obeyed, and that's what happens with Saul. 
Verse 22, then Samuel said, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Now listen to verse 23. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. You see, this chapter really hits hard if you take it seriously because it reveals that people who persist in rebellion will in the end be rejected by God. You understand that? If you persist in rebellion, one day God will say, depart from me, never knew you. One of the major warning signs that we are on the wrong road is revealed in verse 24. Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your words. Well, that sounds good, but listen to the next sentence. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Well, now he's finally told the truth. There's where his loyalties lie. Saul is not loyal to the Lord. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't love the Lord. He has no interest in obeying the Lord. He just wants to please people. He's living for that. You do that, you can't be loving God, can you? I mean, you just can't serve the Lord, while you're trying to give allegiance to anything else. Nothing else can have first place. But here's a man who's trying to please other people. He fears them. He doesn't fear God. And because of that, he's rejected by God. Verse 27, it says, When Samuel turned to go, Saul grabbed the corner of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingship of Israel away from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. And of course we know that neighbor is David. Now the Lord's never wrong about these matters. Verse 29, it says, Furthermore, the Eternal One of Israel, that's the Lord of course, does not lie or change his mind for he is not a man who changes his mind. The Lord's never wrong. And so if the Lord determines that somebody is ripe for judgment, then they are. Verse 30 confirms that the Lord is right because verse 30 shows that Saul isn't concerned, as we've already seen, with the Lord first and foremost. He still cares more about what others think than what God does. So he says, I've sinned, verse 30. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. He's not worried about the fact that he's offended God. He's worried about the fact that his appearance before other people is not what he wants it to be, and he wants to be restored to a right, view in the in his understanding of things before those over whom he rules how prone we are to care more about how we look before others than before god but folks one of these days we're going to have to stand and give an account of our lives aren't we before the god who's made us before the god who rules over all things my hope and my prayer for you and for me, is that we will be done from this day forward with half-hearted obedience. We'll stop making excuses for why we're not doing what the Lord tells us to do. And we'll live with loyalty to Him first and foremost. Well, let us pray. Father, I pray that we will apply this truth to our heart. We'll be people of obedience. We ask that you give us help 
Would you change our hearts, Lord, make our hearts what they're supposed to be for the glory and honor of the one who lives and reigns and who's died and risen again for us, Jesus, our Lord.